Too many companies have a short-term strategy when it comes to data, focusing on the point of purchase moment with a customer rather than building their business around long-term relationships. A Wharton senior fellow at uh, at Wharton, rather, I said that in the correct order, uh, and Google's chief measurement strategist, Neil Hoyne, has led over 2,500 engagements with the world's biggest advertisers, helping them acquire millions of customers, improving conversion rates by over 400%, and generating billions in incremental revenue. In his book, Converted, The Data-Driven Way to Win Customers' Hearts, he shows us how to sharpen our long-term marketing strategy and unleash true value. Ladies and gentlemen of the Good Morning Market audience, you've noticed if you've been watching on video the past few weeks, there's this little yellow book that you can see in the background. I've got the author for you right here, right in front of us. Neil, welcome to Good Morning Market. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for having the book on display. I love it. It's, it's not as obnoxious as all the ones that I have over my shoulder, but uh, no, I appreciate it's, the support. No, I, hey, we're, we're marketers here, okay? We're going to flaunt it. Let's just, let's just you know, put our pitches in there right up front. Um, I will say that um, I can't recall exactly how I discovered, converted, um, re recalling my own buyer's journey, but I do know that I uh, discovered it through LinkedIn. It was referenced, and it seemed like you know the kind of uh, information that I needed to have within my job. I run a, di uh, a digital marketing agency, and so I read the book, and man, once I got a hold of that book, I read it like wildfire. It was very digestible, which is part of how I read it so fast, but I just loved it, and I just knew I had to get you on. So thank you for joining Good Morning Market once again. I do have to ask you, though, a lot of my audience is in the Southeast, specifically the charming historic city of Savannah, Georgia. And at the time of this recording, we're revving up for what we're most famous in the world, which is our St. Patrick's Day parade. I did happen to do a little intel on the last name Hoyne. It sounds like it might be a little Irish. Have you ever made it to Savannah, Georgia? I got to hear the story on that. Not Savannah, Georgia. Uh, the closest I've been was Atlanta, where I was actually, I spent, uh, I think I did a semester at Georgia Tech during undergrad mm. in computer science. And so I was down there. I was just back in the city, I think the first time in about 10 years, um, just to visit some of the CMOs out there a couple months mm. ago. Love the city. Traffic. Mm -hmm. Traffic is always a strange thing. Um, and I, I didn't miss that at all. It was like, keep y'all keep adding on highways and more cars just appear. I uh, know. So I haven't yeah. made it there to the other question. Uh, is there some Irish in my name? I won't tell you what, although maybe some internet students will find it. My name was actually changed about two generations ago by my grandfather oh. from one that was actually Polish and very long okay, and very hard to not only pronounce, but to spell. And so I think just simplifying it in business was the, mm -hmm. uh, was the guidance given to me. He decided, he's like, if no one can pronounce or spell my name, they're not going to answer my call. So I'm going to shorten it to Hoyne, which is what it's been ever since. Yep, that pretty American story, right? Um, although we'll, well, I do have to say that Atlanta and Savannah a little different. So we got we got a much easier airport to get through. You'll have to find some leisure time to to come out and visit us for business or, business or pleasure or both. But let me um, go into the the it. book real quick. Is um, I read it. I took a lot of different notes. But before I even get directly into the book, let me let me talk just about analytics in general. Is uh, all of us in the small business world, small and mid-sized businesses, we know we're supposed to check analytics. A lot of us would like to say that we're analytics driven, but we kind of look at it and we just see charts and graphs. You make a point in the book, one of the first things I wanted to touch on was you tell us to actually look at these things as actual conversations. Don't look at just hits and sessions and whatever. It's, it's actually conversations. Why should businesses look at online behaviors and interactions when we're looking at the lines and graphs and our little analytics portal? Why should we look at that as, as conversations with customers? I think just, you know, data is unnatural. It's not the way we look at the world. It's not the way that we talk to people individually. Can you imagine mm -hmm. meeting somebody for the first time and saying, oh, Neil, give me a little bit about your background. And I pull up a, a pie chart and I say, well, let me explain to you where I spent the time in my life. Mm -hmm. And you... You can interpret it, you can make sense of it, but it is very purposeful, it is very difficult, and as a small business owner, you have better things to do. Mm -hmm. And now, you may think that that is an exclusive fault to small or medium-sized businesses. It's not. It manifests mm -hmm. even in large corporations. Mm -hmm. They just handle it differently. Mm -hmm. They'll do more external presentations about all their data, but still, are any of the decision makers looking at it? Mm -hmm. And so what do we talk about with conversations? We really say, instead of looking at data and charts and trying to make sense of it and saying, oh, sales went up and traffic went down, really to start everything with a hypothesis or an opportunity. Mm -hmm. What business question are you trying to answer? What are you trying to learn? What do you think will change the way that you run your business tomorrow? Mm -hmm. 
And then what data then does is data is to say, not necessarily a chart, but say, can it help you answer that? Mm -hmm. And that's what it's really doing because we can't observe all the people coming to our website. Mm -mm. We, we can't see them. And so data is that language we have to understand, but you can't just jump in. Instead, you say, well, what may we think about doing differently based on what we could find? And so using data to help answer those questions about your business, maybe you see something in a, in a physical store and you're like, could we replicate that? Are people buying these products? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you wonder, we're not reaching younger demographics. Are they going to our website? The best data-driven efforts are all ones that start with that very natural language. What do you think is happening? What do you want to do differently? In some mm -hmm. cases, actually even trusting your gut, which isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And then the data just comes in to say, are we headed in the right direction? Does this data reflect what you're seeing or what you believe will happen? And then that other part is to being open to the conclusions. You know, mm -hmm. oftentimes as individuals, we, we form our opinions and our impressions fairly quickly. And there's a, a study from a couple years ago where a couple of academics brought in a whole bunch of executives and they showed them a PowerPoint presentation, not the entire thing, just kind of that executive summary to say, say you're a business owner and here's an opportunity for you. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And you know, some of those, some of those business people raised their hand and said, I like this. And other people raised their hand and said, I don't like this, but everyone said, I need more data. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what they did. So over the next couple of weeks, they each received a few more slides of data. Now, here's academics are playing a game, though. For everyone that raised their hand that they said they like it, they gave them slides that said, this is the worst opportunity any company could pursue. <laughs> and for those that hated it, they gave them slides that say, this is the best thing ever. And, uh, and at the end of the day, they came back, and really the research question that they didn't reveal to people, where they were saying, how often do people actually listen to the data? Once they have that question, should we mm -hmm. go into this market? Mm -hmm. Would they listen to what the data was saying? And they found out that nearly, I think it was like 89% of the participants kept their original decision. Wow. They looked at the data. Wow. But the data, and the only thing the data changed was this, that nearly all the participants were more confident with their decision because they looked at some data. Mm. But the data just yeah. reinforced what they felt in their gut was the right answer. And so that's part of the process is just to be aware to say the data may sometimes take you in a different direction, but that's part of the exploration is to say, can you find a better source of truth from that data? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, that's business, but you just want to be a little bit better because of that exercise. Right. And I think that what you just uh, stated now, and I definitely get that point in your book is don't put the cart before the horse. Like for example, in Google Analytics, this is an example a lot of our audience will be uh, familiar with is when you just go to Google Analytics and you're waiting for it to just start yelling at you what you should know and what you should do with your business, almost like turning on the TV and just kind of you know uh, chilling out and watching TV, it's not gonna do that. But if you go in there and I, I go into an analytics platform, which is a tool and say, I before I even start looking at charts, I want to know if I can find the answer to this question or if I can find data to help inform me about this challenge or answer. Then I find the tool is much more productive because I already knew what I was looking for before I even went into the tool. And then it's like you said, it's, it's a, if that's, you're that's open okay. enough to it, you can let the data inform your decision. That, that's exactly it. And it also gets you out of the tool itself. So mm -hmm. oftentimes if you start and you say, I'm going to look at Google Analytics and see what's happening today. You're with, Traffic is up in Brazil. Mm -hmm. All right, but we're only based in the Southeast. What, what does Brazil want? And it leads you on that frustrating quest. What do I do with this? Mm -hmm. If you start with a hypothesis, then the next part of your question is, who can help me answer it? Mm -hmm. In that case, Google Analytics may be something. Maybe it's your email marketing platform that has some better information. Maybe it's somebody else at your company. And so oftentimes, one of the important parts is not only to keep that hypothesis inside you and go on the singular expedition, but to write it down and to say, I wonder if anybody else has seen the same thing. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the great disservices that business leaders can do is you keep an idea in your head. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, I think this is happening, but then it's, do I have the tools? I love getting those hypotheses out to as many people as possible to see what data do they have? Have mm -hmm. they seen this happen in their business? Where would mm -hmm. they go in Google Analytics if they wanted to find an answer? Mm -hmm. And that just accelerates how quickly you can learn and adapt to markets. Mm. Very good. Let me let me pivot a little bit. Is uh, now let me take you what I sure. down what I think is potentially the dark side of it. As I literally had a conversation with a uh, successful uh, business owner, he he was looking at the analytics to to his view several different platforms, and I had come to him uh, talking about the possibility of getting better insights from his customers through 
what I call the traditional means of doing like potentially a focus group or some surveys or customer interviews, that classic market research. And he's like, well, I've had him and some others say, well, I have analytics now. I, I don't need to do customer interviews or surveys or focus groups. What is your opinion or experience when it comes to the role of analytics and whether or not it uh, nullifies uh, the need for those other investigation methods? I, I look at all of them as being helpful to, you know, one of the quotes I use in the, in the book was that, you know, the world is a, the desk is a dangerous place by which to view the world. Mm -hmm. uh, analytics can't capture everything. Mm -hmm. uh, back, I remember there was a great experiment at Google. This was back in 2010. If any of you remember, I'm going to date myself here, MySpace. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an integration to say, <laughs> could we take, yeah, could we take MySpace data? Those of you that aren't familiar with it before Facebook, can we mm -hmm. take that data? And with the partnership with MySpace, can we improve our ad delivery? Mm -hmm. And what we actually found out was no, ad delivery went down 35% in terms of effectiveness. And the reason was that MySpace, that data source, the hypothesis was that was how people wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. These are the brands I want to be affiliated with, not who I actually am. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we see that and we also miss those opportunities. Somebody may be looking at a product and you say, wow, they really like these boots. Well, maybe it's because they didn't know you also sold shoes or sandals. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you need to talk to customers to inspire that thinking. But what I would argue is the only time you make a mistake is being too focused on one versus the other. Saying, I'm okay. only gonna look at Google Analytics and not talk to customers and say, I'm gonna mm -hmm. get all my data exclusively from the field and I'm gonna miss what's happening on those computer screens. And so they're all yeah. valuable tools that add to your perspective and how much you know. And I wasn't planning on asking this, but it almost makes me feel like, you know, if, if really analytics were sufficient within themselves, it's kind of a closed loop conversation because every it must be trackable and definable in order to be measurable within that paradigm, at least from my seed. But isn't that even why we have burgeoning fields such as like a user experience research where uh, an observer will sit and watch the person uh, interface with, for example, a website because you're trying to actually have them communicate to you in real time as they go through a website experience, which is then being tracked with some kind of measurement tool, right? So it sounds like, you know, like there's additional context that can't be captured just by definition within an analytics tool. That, that's, that's exactly it. Look, analytics tools, when you go back to the early, early versions of it, wasn't built on business circumstances. It was built to what you said, what we could measure. Mm -hmm. Now they've grown up and they've become a little bit more robust, but again, mm -hmm. more data, maybe some business questions, but it still comes down to that hypothesis to say, there are some things that you can't answer unless you talk to customers. Here's an example. Uh, ad blocker adoption in the U.S. I think mm -hmm. eMarketer had a study where for people 18 to 24, their adoption is about 60%, which is the highest out of all demographics, which means guess what? Your web analytics tools aren't going to notice it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to notice those audiences. And if you only use your demographic reports as is, what's it going to say? Younger audiences don't come to my website. Mm -hmm. They must be someplace else. Older people love it. When you do experiments, you may be like, wow, this creative, this journey is what everybody wants. But until you talk to those people and someone connects the dots and say, yeah, I love your website. Do you also use ad blockers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then they're blind to you. Mm. And so that's why you need that. It's not that anyone should inherently know that, but you only know this talking to customers, observing their behaviors, asking them those questions. How do you feel about sharing data online? Do you use ad blockers? Mm -hmm. What about what's happening with our competitors? Mm -hmm. What happens if you don't even come to our site and I can't even measure your interactions? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And what were those influences? And so I think all of it works in balance. I don't think you need to become necessarily a expert only in Google Analytics or an expert at focus groups. Mm -hmm. What you want to be is aware of the toolkit. And okay. so when you're going to answer those questions, you can pull on that toolkit to say, here's where I think I may get some of this an some of these answers the fastest. Right. And, and I think that that's a, a big part of um, where I think the book is helpful is it, you go down a lot, you, you tell a lot of testimonials from your time at Google, for example, uh, walking down different scenarios with some really big advertising agencies, some of the biggest companies in the world, and some of, some of how our preconceived biases or are following a tool too closely or that, that it can lead down a lot of uh, dark paths. As I re read through the book, I, you know, one of the my favorite parts of the book, and it's arguably, you know, one of the most uh, helpful and pragmatic right here and now for businesses of any size is what you call the chocolate cake. I think it's you know, maybe a third of the way through the book, uh, halfway through the book, 
And it's something that that is a, a known stat called customer lifetime value, but it's not just like a cool stat. It, it, it really, I, I, I likened it when I reviewed your book more to like, it's, it's an approach. So it's a stat that's represented, um, that represents how you treat relationships. Not all relationships are equally valuable. And so there's actually a statistical method and approach to organize your customers and to um, you, just, you, you, you find a way to score them. And so this this book yeah. covers in great detail and then talks about how you can use it to guide your business in a lot of different respects, uh, customer lifetime value. Can you provide a nugget on why you believe this approach to be so powerful? Well, first, quantitatively, we know it's accurate. So there's mm -hmm. about three or four decades of published peer-reviewed research that said, we have the capability of understanding and modeling how customers are going to spend over time. That's really what mm -hmm. lifetime value is. Mm -hmm. It's looking at a relationship mm -hmm. and saying, how valuable is this relationship going to be to my business? Mm -hmm. When we go a step further and we say, all right, we know we can predict it. Mm -hmm. What does it say? We find out that relationships actually model a lot of what we see in our real world, which is we know some people in our lives are incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. We know some other people, great relationships, but they're transactional. I joke around constantly. You know, you give an Uber driver a five-star rating. It was great. He got me where I needed to go safely. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to him for real estate advice. I'm not going to ask him how his kids are. We will probably never see each other again. And it's not that I didn't enjoy that moment or it couldn't be my Uber driver. It's just I have to recognize there's nothing else there. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with your customers. There's going to be some customers that you depend on that are happy to pay full price, come in routinely, spend in your category, aren't going to leave. Mm -hmm. And there's some that no matter how hard you try to market to them, they're not going to come back. Mm -hmm. And just understanding that and think about that, not from the data, but just from a practical reality. If I said, here's 10% of your customers that the only time they're going to come in is when you send them a coupon code. So you're selling something at a deep discount and then they buy and then they leave just as quickly. And here's some customers that if you sent them the same coupon, they'd redeem it, but they were more happy to pay full price. And they weren't going anywhere, but you spent marketing money and you gave away margin to do it. And you start to realize that a lot of companies, when you're fixated only on the here and now, did somebody buy this product today and you don't have the time to build that relationship with them, how much money you're leaving on the table, how better it could be to understand and to personalize. And imagine one of those high value customers calls you up over the phone. Do you want to make sure you get their questions answered faster than people to say they're only looking for the lowest price? Mm -hmm. And that's really all we're looking at. We're talking about this is we're just putting mm -hmm. customers in buckets to say how much value are they going to deliver? And it turns out a small portion of customers deliver a lot. Mm -hmm. And so now we have names associated with them and we can start making decisions just in their in their frame of reference. And and I think that it's like you said, we all instinctively know like, hey, follow the money. We all instinctively know that, you know, 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. You, you recite that uh, stat, which is a proven like – it's a business proverb for a reason, but you know, it opens up all kinds of doors because what you, you document when you actually start to put your customers in those buckets, follow the money, but it represents a larger story about people and their relationships with your business. You can not only do it, but based off of how loyal or how much they love your product, you can also do it to identify, like you said, um, VIPs who are early in their buyer's journey, right? So if if I have someone who's kind of like in the middle of the road in terms of a snapshot of how much they've spent with me at a given time, but I can then use, for example, the predictive side of the customer lifetime value model to say, well, you know what? Based off of projections, I'm, I think we have a VIP here who's just early in their relationship with me. I need to then uh, interact with them accordingly. And, and if you segment your customers right and you've had enough good conversations to know your VIPs and why and, and how you can increase value and delight and all that stuff, then you can just go supernova beyond what most, I know, for example, small and mid-sized businesses are doing because it's just, it takes some work, but once you can put your customers in those kind of buckets, it opens up all kinds of new opportunities to give people what they want in relationship to your business. Because like you said, there's several different types of customers along several different types of relationship journeys. I, I don't know if I'm necessarily asking a question here. I'm just stating how emphatic and no, revelatory that was for me. That's, that's, that's exactly it. And it's a revelation to a lot of businesses. And think about this, not from a business owner perspective, think about this as a customer perspective. If you've mm -hmm. ever gone into a restaurant mm -hmm. or hotel 
or retail store and in the back of your head maybe you receive poor service or nobody prioritized your help and you're thinking if only they knew how much i could spend with them mm -hmm. or how much money i spend in this category how often i go out to eat wow imagine what they would do for me if you ever get on i travel a lot i travel i have my carriers i know delta's big in the southeast i mm -hmm. generally travel on united airlines but imagine mm -hmm. if i go to american and i say if only they knew how much i spent in travel mm -hmm. would i really be in boarding group 60. <laughs> and this is right. really what that is is that's that prediction to say who are those people or maybe the most practical ones if you see someone pull up in front of your physical retail store in a really expensive car are you thinking they have a little bit more money to spend Mm -hmm. These are just those hints and those cues of things that maybe in the real world you could understand uh, just by looking at someone or having that conversation. But here we have to go back into the, to your original point. We have data to do it. Mm -hmm. And lifetime values that equalize or to say, here's somebody that may not have a lot now, may not be spending a lot on their first transaction, but they will come mm -hmm. back. They will be with you for a while. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, even, wouldn't you want to know that as a business? Wouldn't you want to compare that and say, here's all the email addresses you collected. How many of those people are coming back? And so that's why it's so yes. powerful. That's why so many businesses are just eager to jump right in and say, I need to understand this for my customers. Mm -hmm. Their name, their email address is not enough. I need this lifetime value. Right. So I, 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 I'm I fully tracking. I had two follow-up questions on CLV. One sure. I was just thinking of, because I remember in your book, you, 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 and people need to read the book, obviously, um, but you talk about don't go crazy on the deep end of the pool immediately. It's just uh, you at first kind of slowly emphasize more of the high value and then de-emphasize more of the low value when you get that model baked out. But another thing you said I thought was quite interesting is the simplest version when we're doing, for example, um, targeted advertising using this model and using um, like lookalike audiences or when we're going after the higher value segments. You said at first, that approach is better but over time as you get to know your your customer base and your ideal customer better you should actually do your targeting based off of the characteristics and, rather than just you know giving the the advertising engine uh, a list to mimic or or spit out why is that valuable once you start to get a, a higher level of um so sophisticatedness when it comes to uh just spitting out the list versus uh, going after characteristics when you're doing a, a, uh, an advertising audience? So the, the simple answer is it's around ownership. And I'll give okay. you this example. So let's walk through this. If you're just getting started with this, you could easily categorize and, and label all your customers, say, here's the high value ones. You could hand it over to your ad network of choice and say, use all your signals to find me more people like them. Mm -hmm. It's easy. You don't have to do any work. You trust them to do it. You measure them based on who they bring in. But after a while, in order to really get to where your business can be, you need to start thinking about, well, why? What, mm. what makes those people really compatible with me? What are those signals? Because mm -hmm. think about it. If you're doing creative uh, strategy, and you're thinking, what message should I give people? Or you're mm -hmm. trying to build new products or you're trying to source new inventory. You want to have those really valuable customers in mind. You don't just want to say, well, I know Facebook or Google got them for me. You want mm -hmm. to know the details about what makes them special and unique. And that awareness starts to change the way that you interact with people, mm. who you're going after when those customers come in, how you're building your business. Maybe you'll even see a new opportunity when you're doing a focus group. I want mm -hmm. to spend time talking to these people. You mm -hmm. want to understand who they are and what they like, what their interests are. Mm -hmm. And you miss that really. It's kind of like you're going through a friend. You know, it's mm, be like, hey, yeah. here's somebody I really get along with. And you want to ask them a question, well, well, why, why are we good? Why are you so sure? And they're like, trust me. <laughs> like, okay, right. yeah, that's okay at first. But then you're like, no, no, hey, what, what did you see here? Was it, we had the same profession, we grew up in the same place. What was that connection that made the difference? Yep. And you also want to know that on the opposite side, who are the people you don't get along with? We think about growth all the time. Yeah. Or, but I also want to know, who are you spending money on mm -hmm. that's wasting your time? Again, mm -hmm. going back to personal relationships, if you ever go on a few dates and you're like, look, I just don't get along with, with people that are like this or do this mm -hmm. in their lives or have these personalities, you just, I'm just going to stay away from the great people, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. You need to learn these characteristics instead of saying, hey, Facebook and Google just stayed away from these people for me. You yeah. really want to understand they're your customers first and foremost. Yep. So you want to go from very easy, it proves that you have that ability to intimately understanding who these people are.
And I'll say for the audience, you know, for the listeners, this is this is imperative for us to understand to truly own your budget and to truly own your marketing program on the deepest level. Like like Neil's saying, is you have to know what who you're going after and why you're going after them. Like this morning, I made an impulse purchase. I'm going to confess. You know, my wife's probably going to listen to this, but I made an impulse purchase. I I don't know if it's because I've been watching more drum videos lately, but I was scrolling across Facebook and I got this really cool high um, uh, graphic. A photo of uh, jewelry that was made out of broken cymbals for a drum set. So I play drums. I've never broken a cymbal, but like you break cymbals from time to time if you're playing hard. And so they had these cool uh, place in Salt Lake that makes um, jewelry out of broken drum cymbals. And so I clicked it and I went and purchased it. And I was, I know, but then I thought to myself, because of course I'm a marketer, I'm like, was I just modeled after one of their, uh, you know, their customer bases, or did was it because I had been doing this scrolling activity more often than I was the past week that they targeted me? So, but that's the thing is like if you can start to think at that level, and I made a high value purchase. I did. I even did uh, the stuff where I was adding on stuff to the cart that they suggested, and some of the stuff you talked about. So that's how those sophisticated and they're a small business, but if you're sophisticated enough, it opens up a whole new level of possibility. So. I do want to ask Neil one follow-up question on CLV and, and using that model for um, finding your ideal customers. But let's real quick take a break to uh, listen to today's sponsor for the episode, Soul Insights. This episode is sponsored by Soul Insights. Is your business looking to hit the next level of growth? For many businesses, they know they need to spend more on marketing, but don't want to simply shoot in the dark. They want a smart, data-driven path to solid growth. If this is you, then Soul Insights can help you identify, attract, and retain ideal customers. Soul Insights is a strategic marketing agency which helps small and mid-sized businesses understand their best customers, who they are, their shopping behaviors, and acquire new best customers based on that data. Oh, and it's all measured and tracked to ensure you get more profit bang for your marketing buck. Head to soulinsights.com right now and take the 90 second quiz to find your path to the next level. So Neil, I uh, wanted to ask you one more question about a CLV. You talk about if you have enough volume of transactions, both in terms of history and just the number of customers with an ID, for example, that you can do what's called not just historic customer lifetime value modeling. You can also do predicted and you talk about breaking it up in half where you can then like check the trend to see if it really matches your data set. And like, there's a lot of cool things that the book goes into. For some of us smaller businesses, we just don't have the database yet. I think it's 5,000 transact or 5,000 customers was your recommended in a three year life cycle at the minimum. What's your advice for, for businesses who read the book and they're like, man, I want to do this, but they can't yet do, um, or at least to the definition predicted CLV targeting. So there's nothing wrong with looking backwards at how customers behave. And so some of those okay. techniques, which you'd want to look up is like, um, RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary value. Those are the precursors to lifetime value, but they were all historical, how people behaved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the common analogy there is it's kind of like someone comes into your restaurant and they spend a lot of money, but it's for a wedding. Mm -hmm. Are they going to come back and do weddings every year? You hope not. I mean, just, <laughs> from a business owner's side, I guess it would be great, your wedding plan. Yeah. But otherwise, you're, right. you're like, they spent a lot of money. They're not sure they're going to do. But it's still better then just looking at what happened in one time period for one window. So looking at individual transactions, what 90% of small businesses do is where you start. Then you can go and say, hey, things like RFM, let's just mm -hmm. look at how often people buy, how much they spent on each transaction, are additive to start getting you towards that story while you collect more data and you move to that lifetime value lens. And so it's a transition of using what you have to move you through that curriculum. The other thing that I'd mention, mm -hmm. if you just have customer data, one of the professors uh, over at Wharton, Peter Fader, who built a lot of these models, who's dedicated 30, 35 years of his career to studying lifetime value, also recognized that it's a problem with startups, with small businesses, that yeah. they want to start playing around with this idea of my customers being different, but they don't have enough data or maybe enough time to calculate it. He did also write a book called, you can, it's a very academic title, The Customer Base Audit. Now, if you get past it, oh, do you have a copy? Uh, because so, of you recommended it. Customer base audit. <laughs> and, and the customer base audit, if you ever want to talk to Pete and bring him on the show, I can, I can make an introduction. But just wrote it to say, before you feel like you can calculate and model predictive behavior, here's how we can look at the customer data you certainly have already captured mm -hmm. and figure out the health of your business. 
where mm -hmm. things are going, where adjustments need to be made, where we think there's pockets of value. And one of the same precision as a lifetime value model, and you don't want to use it as a substitute. You just almost want to use it as training wheels to say, mm -hmm. hey, we're doing, we're busy. This will get us started. And then mm -hmm. when we start to see the power of this firsthand, then maybe we'll have the, the data and the confidence to make that leap. Right. And then once again, once you do get enough volume of data to where you can then transition to using predictive uh, customer lifetime value, uh, per the go. book, I believe your recommendation is to um, basically chart it out. And the first half of the data set, you want to, uh, I believe you said, leave for historic, I guess, observation in the past, reporting, and then use the second half of the data. Uh, would it be the second ha half of the, of the customer IDs that you then use to model out what you should be um, seeing? I, I, maybe you could just give a little clarifier for someone who's a little bit newer yeah, to this the, principle. The nice thing about it, we explain some of the tools in the book and provide references mm -hmm. on the book's website, is yep, that yep. the modeling packages we're recommending. I know modeling packages sounds very sophisticated. All right, the math we use will automatically mm -hmm. split the data set in half. Okay. And the reason it does this is that if you put in 24 months worth of data, mm -hmm. you don't want to have to wait 24 more months in the future to figure out whether it was right. And so it's going to take point. that data and split into half and say, all right, for 12 months of data, for the first 12 months, we're going to model all the customers and what we expect them to do for the next 12 months. Now, we already have that next 12 months tucked in the data set. That's what we asked for two years. Yeah. But we're not going to share it with the model. And what we're going to use to assess the goodness of this model is seeing how closely do those two numbers align. So mm. we take the first 12 months and say, let's predict what these customers are going to do. And what we look for is how, what type of separation do we see to say, we predicted these customers would spend here, they actually spent there. Uh, and that gives us a sense to say, does the model actually work with the data we have? Okay, okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So um, bringing it uh, home and, and transitioning towards some of the other insights from the book is there's a lot of, once again, I, people would, would think about what we're talking about today and, or the book, and they would think like, oh, this is a technical how-to manual and a bunch of stats and whatnot. Really, it's a, I think it's just a, an approach to business that is just really proven. And I love how in the book you talk about um, – don't don't get paralysis by analysis. It's it's all about that kind of blend of getting getting good data and following the data, but then also maintaining agility. You you referenced some of the other clients that you worked with that wanted to have the perfect multi bajillion dollar uh, data warehouse engine before they wanted to move on something. And by the time you build the the perfect uh, data tool, then it's already obsolete or it, it doesn't even do what it's supposed to do. One of the other things you talk about, which once again, sounds counterintuitive. I've even found myself when I'm talking about the data driven approach to growing a business, talking about the, the efficiency and the assurance, and you're able to measure and you can not guarantee ROI, but you can be much more assured. Neil in the book mm -hmm. takes a step to say, Hey, you know what? I want you to do something crazy here. I want you to take 10% of your marketing budget and I want you to dedicate it for exploration where the the goal and the expectation is we're going to learn lessons, not so much that we're going to get 5X you know, MROI. Why is this type of marketing spend important for businesses to not you know, want 4X every single dollar? You actually want them to consistently dedicate a portion of their budget for exploration and learning. You know, it's just when we look at marketing budgets as a whole, you know, generally the guidance from accounts will be like, you want marketing to be about 10% of your, your total expenses or yeah, revenue. It's like, that. all right, 10%. And you want that marketing money to get you as much as it possibly can. And that's mm -hmm. great. You want mm -hmm. to make as much money as you can today. Mm -hmm. What I'm arguing for is that there's actually a related business function. In public companies, you may call it R&D. Right. To say we need to put investments towards the future of our business. And in this case, I'm arguing for the future of your customers. So that mm -hmm. way that growth can continue for your business. And I'm not mm -hmm. asking companies. I almost say, look, have your 10% of your marketing budget. That's towards generating revenue. But build whatever you call it. R&D may be too sophisticated. But that function to say, make sure you're putting a portion of your money towards understanding the most valuable asset you have for your business, your customers. And if you put that money in the same pile as marketing, you're going to look at it to be like, we need everything to work. We need everything to generate yeah. these returns. Here's what we lost. The goal of this function is learnings. Can you learn more about how your customers behave? And so mm -hmm. that way, you know how to connect with them. You know how to message them, when to offer them a promotion and when not to offer them a promotion. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you skip that step, 
you're just kind of grinding away and hoping we can make small incremental improvements based on guesses or things that other people have done. This is really taking the future of your business in your hands and saying, we need to make those investments today so that mm -hmm. in a year from now, your future you will thank you mm -hmm. for having those new insights and ways to reach customers. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I break it apart because otherwise there's never a good time to take your marketing budget and try new things. You want to get, yeah. especially now in today's economic circumstances, we want to get as much mm -hmm. as we can out of it. But I almost argue it's the same thing that we, we run into just in our daily lives. Look, you want to go out there and you want to grind at work for that promotion or that next customer to make more money. And one of the first things I see a lot of executive sacrifice is they sacrifice well-being. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I can, I, can, I can lose weight later on. I can exercise mm -hmm. later on. And that later on becomes 30, 40 years. Now mm -hmm. they're in the doctor's office and the doctor's like, you need to take better care of yourself. And so that's what we're kind of saying is in order to keep your business healthy, mm -hmm. this is that exercise you need to do. And that payoff is not only supported by plenty of evidence from other people mm -hmm. that have studied to say this is a worthwhile thing, just like exercise, but it's also that payoff is in the future to say, future you will thank you, mm -hmm. taking out a little time, a little resources today to build that future for them. Would I be tracking if one of the analogy that I was thinking of in your description there was like, um, I, I have a small business, so I have a certain kind of you know bottom line. I can extract that and pay myself. I can pay Philip or wisely, I probably should be always taking a percentage of that and reinvesting it back into the business, even though I could pocket it and say, hey, I, I earned this. This is yes. my money. I could pay myself. But probably a wise entrepreneur would want to reinvest. That 10%, for example, is a way to reinvest in your customers, reinvest in your marketing program, reinvest in your business long term because you're not going to hold it to that short term ROI pocketed cash. There, there you go. And whenever you look at those people, those companies, and you say, how did they get so far ahead? How come they were successful? Mm. How come they had time to you know, exercise? It's because they purposely made those trade-offs. Mm. And if there's nothing else from this book and everything else, and I, I know data books are tough to read because like, I have a few hours tonight. Do I want to watch something on TV? I want to read a data book. If there's one message that I tried to carry through the entire book, it's empathy. To say, mm. I understand the trade-offs that business owners have to make in terms of looking at data versus running their business, investing for immediate marketing growth versus long-term, mm -hmm. reading a data book or watching TV. These are all decisions and trade-offs we have to make. Mm -hmm. And it comes from the position to say, there are plenty of companies in front of you. When you want to know the secret to success, it's really that a lot of companies say, not only am I going to do what's necessary for the short term, but I'm going to make those investments earlier than most of my competition will deem appropriate mm -hmm. in the long term. I'll look at long-term relationships. I'll study what this, this R&D thing. I'll study what the future of marketing is for my business. Mm -hmm. I'll learn more about this data and I'll make those investments. And those pay off. Guys, there's time for tactics, there's time for strategy, and there's time for vision. And I think that's what Neil is trying to tell us, to have a, a couple different buckets to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. My final question for you is, um, I recommend folks, I'm just going to straight out, straight out, I, I already reviewed the book. I'm going to endorse it. If people didn't already know, I'm endorsing it. Uh, I endorse that folks, it's a business book. It's not a big business book. It's not a small business book. It's not for the marketing department. It's for business folks. If you at all are involved in earning customer relationships and developing customer relationships, you should get converted. Uh, it does get you started on the data-driven way in a very powerful way. Um, I do want to ask you outside of, you know, maybe they want to read the book. What, sure. what is a, a first step for the person listening to this episode right now, uh, a business leader looking to be data-driven? What's a great first step for them? You know, the, the first thing I would do is I'd go down and I, and this is, a, this is what I recommend. Take a notebook okay, and write down those hypotheses first. What I'm offering you is hypotheses to say it's better to focus on long-term value of customers than short-term. Mm -hmm. But a lot of businesses skip that step. Ask your partners, ask your friends, what are the hypotheses? What are the things you should try for your business? Mm. Then the next thing I want to say is how quickly can you get there? Mm -hmm. How quickly can you test? How quickly can you put that into your business? That's a, that's a velocity that a lot of companies mm -hmm. don't have is that they, they never take that step back to say, what could I be doing next? Now, even if you're looking through that list and you're saying, look, I'm already working 60 hours a week. I don't have time to try new things. Right. Still write that list. Because when things slow down or you're looking for opportunities for growth, or maybe you're talking to other people who have the same ideas, these are the invaluable insights. In my area around in data science, especially when we hire people to mine through data all the time, you're surprised as to how many ideas are left behind, how many things your customers will tell you, how many things you'll read about. Start that learning agenda to say, these are the things that I want to test for my business that could contribute growth. 
Mm -hmm. Now, one of them is lifetime value, and I'd say that should probably be at the top of the list. Yep. But don't let mm -hmm. other ideas pass you by. If you're listening to this podcast, as you're mm -hmm. reading, don't miss out on those ideas just because you may not have the resources or time today. Mm -hmm. Build that agenda for data. And then that next step goes back to that original question, which is start back at that question to say, now that I have all these hypotheses, does anybody have data on this? How yeah. can I figure out if this is true? And what you're likely going to find out is your network, your friends have likely seen, if not tested, mm -hmm. and are already going to give you that path to growth. Love that, that lifetime value, I can tell you there's 30 years of evidence saying it works. You mm -hmm. don't need to test it yourself. You just need to jump right in. Mm -hmm. But do that with all the other ideas. You have that process. There's no end to how far you can grow. I love it. Yeah. D no, don't come up with your new uh, amazing advanced theory. It's time to move and learn with the data that's already out there for you to grab and improve upon. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is Neil exactly. Hoyne, the chief strategist of data and measurement at Google. The book is converted. Uh, it came out last year. It was a great book. It's available for purchase for, uh, on Amazon and he has a companion website to his uh, for his book where you can learn more about the book and, and make a purchase. Neil, in, in conclusion, um, how can people connect with you? You know, LinkedIn is probably the best for me right now. Um, and that will tie in together. I, I always send people emails because it's easier. But LinkedIn is probably what I keep up to date. I post news on just because it works for me. Uh, but that's where I'd go. Uh, guys, I concur with that. He's a great follow. I um, I even use the text I do at the Garamond because I saw you post one time research. I think it was from the Journal of Marketing Research about how it was the mo one of the most easily legible uh, and quickest to read fonts. So like you'll learn all kinds of things following Neil on LinkedIn. But Neil, thank you so much for joining Good Morning Market. Um, amazing insights. And thank you for writing the book. I really think it's going to be helpful to my business and a lot of folks who are out there reading it right now. My pleasure. Thanks again for having me.